So now let's uh, go into that. So uh, you start approaching these banks. So before that, you build your product. Uh, you were already working on that technology part of it. So uh, personally, I have not built the product, and uh, and that's why uh, it was more challenging. So uh, when uh, I had started approaching banks, uh, the first question was, "Where is the product?" So of course, I had to lie. I was like, "Yeah, it's just about to come out in a couple of weeks." So they're like, where's your office? And I'm like, my office is like this in the BKC somewhere, I should get some fake address for my friends. Uh, so investment banking helped you. Yeah, so <laughs> you, you learn all those things, right? So uh, so I think my office was mostly at that point of time was uh, either the hired lobby because nobody used to ask you why you're sitting there and uh, I could have all the meetings uh, or private right, lobby. So I used to spend most of my time there. Okay. But uh, and at what stage you start building the product and how you went about so, uh, so what well, the first thing we did is uh, since I was not a tech guy and I had absolutely no clue about technology what I knew is uh, in terms of what is required to deliver the experience to the merchant and consumer uh, or what is required to operate a payment system so this is the part I knew well so, uh, so I hired external uh, vendor uh, who I knew from ICC days and uh, I sought his help. I promised him that, okay, you make, uh, so I did not raise the funding till then. So I promised him that, uh, why don't you make uh, technology for me on a SaaS basis? I will pay you per year transaction basis because I wanted to do this myself. That, if I invest uh, uh, roles of fees and then no transactions are happening, I end up going down. So I will. So I wanted to pass that risk to the company that like we will stick on as you as we grow, you grow together. And uh, fortunately, that guy agreed, and uh, it worked out. Uh, he built technology for me. Yeah. So it was, I think, uh, I would say good or bad both. Good in the sense uh, we could start the business. Bad in the sense. Uh, that decision uh, held us back uh, our growth for next two years. So next two years we could not scale up well because that guy started realizing after we got the funding that okay this guy is funded so I should extract more money from him. So uh, he, he suddenly uh, sent me the invoice which is 10 times to the green price. So I was like this was not agreed. I was like okay if you are not agreeing I will disconnect the system. So suddenly I could go down uh, in a day's time. So, so we, we started negotiating and in the negotiation I spent six months with him. And in the meantime, uh, we started building our teams. So I think in the eight months time we built a parallel system. And actually there was a time where he actually disconnected without telling me. Fortunately, I think uh, I was very lucky that uh, just a month before we had built a new system and we were very ready that if something goes wrong, we can just switch over the system within a day's time. And uh, we managed to do that. So, uh, how did you go about building your team? I mean, you, know, you get a tech co founder or how did you start hiring for So, uh, tech has been the most difficult and uh, till date, I think, is the most scarce commodity as such. So you uh, don't get uh, tech people very easily. So I went through my own set of challenges. So uh, I hired the first uh, tech guy, the senior tech guy, uh, after I think uh, seven or eight months of starting the company. In the time I was relying on the external guy. So we hired him. Uh, it was a wrong hire uh, because. Uh, I had no idea how to evaluate a tech guy. Till date, by the way, I don't know. So, uh, so uh, we hired him. I think after a couple of months, once what happened, our system was down, and I asked him, "Hey, you know our system is down?" Uh, he was like, "Yeah, I know, but you know, uh, I'll come to the office. I'm taking shower right now. I'm like, let this guy come to office. I'm just gonna fire him. But I had to uh, hold on my cool because." Uh, if I had fired him before he made system up, I didn't know how to bring system up. <laughs> so uh, literally our system was down that day for 8 hours, take you know, a payment system down for 8 hours and hundreds of businesses depending on you. That means hundreds of businesses are down. So uh, 
I think that day we lost almost, uh, so it was one, I think one year ahead of starting the business, we had lost 80% uh, of our business, 80% of our clients went away that day. So, uh, as soon as the system came up, I fired that guy without having any alternate tech care. So, that was the uh, most tough call I ever took. Where uh, I was like, I don't care, but I don't want to deal with inefficient people. So, that was the uh, thing, but uh, that taught me many things that never depend on single guy, never hire wrong guy. I, uh, so, I started taking help from Sequoia by, uh, because Sequoia had come in by that time. So, I started taking help from them in evaluating candidates, I started taking help from few of my friends in evaluating candidates. So, I started doing uh, all of that. How to evaluate a tech candidate? It was a big task. So, uh, so, uh, so we we start building our teams internally anyway. So we had uh, uh, we started building. Uh, in fact, tech wise, I was so challenged that uh, I must share this story where I'm like so paranoid that every sales guy also I used to hire a tech guy. So I'm like, uh, my sales guy also should be tech, so some issue comes in, he can handle the system. So my ops guy will take guy, my sales guy will take guy. Like you should have engineering degree to qualify to come into sales. So that, that was the paranoia I had uh, while hiring. Uh, uh, so we ended up hiring a few good people, I would say, after the incident. And uh, till date, those uh, teams are sticking on. And I'm, uh, it's more of a gut feel which I hired initially. So, uh, so my whole gut instinct was based on the passion level of the candidate. That how passionate that guy is when the tough gets going. Whether he is ready to uh, get shoulder on shoulder with me till 1 a.m., 2 a.m. in the night. Or whether that guy is like, no, I'm like looking for a 9 to 5 job. So that was a hiring criteria rather than the skill set, rather than the uh, any other qualification. How large is your tech team now? Oh, now it's like half of the company's tech. So, okay, so we have uh, uh, 260 people in the company and uh, 120 are tech guys. So now uh, I would say our company is known uh, literally uh, if you uh, check from our competitors, investor community, merge our clients. The like Citrus is the most innovative tech company when it comes to the offering. So uh, it's clearly uh, uh, we pay huge, huge attention when it comes to uh, hiring tech and product guys. So, and we have been very uh, choosy. We rather delay our hiring, but uh, we don't. We ensure that we don't bring in the wrong guy in the system. So uh, after I fired my CTO, I don't think I get the next CTO till the next six months. So, uh, by the way, I fired my second CTO also. <laughs> so, uh, after the, so he came into the system uh, after six months and then uh, I realized that, uh, so this time what I did is I hired an oldish guy. So I thought the young guys are like irresponsible, they don't work well. So I hired a guy of the age of 50 and he had, uh, he was CTO of Angama earlier and it was like ruined names and all of that. Uh, I think he was out of energy, so, uh, <laughs> so I fired him after six months again because at the speed at which I wanted, uh, he couldn't match the speed of delivery. So, uh, but now I can uh, say that we are sorted in that segment, and uh, the passion level is uh, number one thing. We still look in the people, so if we don't care whether the guy has uh, relevant experience. Uh, but he has to be passionate enough to do his job. So, in fact, most of our sales product tech are not from payments industry. There are hardly five or six guys in the company who are from payments industry. The rest are, rest all are from non-payments industry. So, uh, let's yes, and let's talk about fundraising. So, at what point in time did you decide that to be one that you now need to kind of fundraising? How did it go about? And uh, so subsequently, how many rounds of fundraising have you already now? Sure. So uh, I think uh, <coughs> fortunate enough that fundraising uh, has been an uh, easier thing for us so far. And uh, so I'll tell you my first uh, fundraising experience. So uh, we started the company in April and uh, of 2011. 
September of two, or August of 2011, uh, as usual, I was sitting in Hyatt's lobby to meet someone. And so he was just finishing his meeting, so he introduced me to him. The super partner asked me, so what do you do? I said, uh, I started this company and uh, trying to uh, uh, do something uh, in payments. He was like, uh, so uh, are you raising funds? I'm, I'm like, uh, no, no, I don't need any funding because at the point I was also talking to uh, fund called Intel Capital. So I had estimated that in next five years we'll do like 20 crores of revenue and one crore of net profit, which is like more than good enough for my life so, uh, every year. So, uh, so that was the aspiration level. So, uh, so I was like, that's good enough. So I told him that, uh, yeah, I'm talking to one of the fund, just raising one crore from them, and uh, that's good enough for us. So you're like, uh, can I ask you a favor? Can you meet me tomorrow morning? I'm like, yeah, if you're meeting me for fundraising, then I'm not keen. But yeah, generally, you know, he said, no, generally I want to talk about payments with you. So uh, so I was like, okay. So I went to Sequoia office uh, in Lower Parel and uh, when I entered the room, there were like all seven people sitting in the room and I discovered that they all were seven partners of Sequoia at the point of time. And uh, so they started firing questions, they started asking about payments and what's my thinking and all of that. And uh, so I was a little uh, uh, surprised that was happening here, but still I was like, let's go with the flow. Uh, no harm in answering what they're asking and saying, all Sarita and Sikoy is a great name uh, to deal with. So uh, after that, uh, Mohit, who was uh, the partner, he said, okay, fine. <coughs> Nice meeting you, you can go. So came home. I got a call from him in the evening and he was like, uh, how much uh, money you're raising? Uh, can you send me the projections, uh, what, you are ra what you have made for the business? So I was like, okay. Uh, so I sent him the projections. So he called me back again literally in uh, 10 minutes. So like I looked at the projections. Uh, I think they are very, very conservative in terms of what you're trying to build and uh, uh, what you have projected. So, so he was like, uh, let's say if I want to give you my, how much money uh, you need. So I'm like, wow, this is Sequoia, so I should ask double. So, so I said, uh, I need two crores. So then he said, uh, okay, but your projections somehow don't justify a raise of two crores. So can you just revise it and then uh, send it back to me? So I said, okay, I'll send it back. So I sent him back. Literally, what I did is added into four, uh, all cells into four, and then sent him back. So the requirement became four crores. So, so, so I sent him back, and he was like, uh, okay, I think uh, I'm not convinced yet that uh, in four crores you can build a business. So why don't you uh, do something uh, to just relook at the projection? I'm like, probably I'm doing too much of hurriedness. I'm sending him immediately in half an hour response. So I should wait for one day and then send him. So, uh, so what I did is I said, okay, I'll, I'll take time when I need to think now. So, uh, so I, I actually waited for the next day and then uh, next day what I did is I did it into eight. And then, and then I uh, sent him uh, all the projections and then you were like, it then seems like you are not uh, understanding what you are trying to build. I think this business requires millions and millions of dollars. Uh, you need to become more ambitious. I'm like, let him say whatever he's saying. I just want this money. That's it. <laughs> so, so, uh, so, so he was like, okay, how much you are? Uh, so, how much uh, stake you want to give? I'm like. Uh, 10% for one crore I want to give. So he was like, okay, let me do one thing. Let me send you something and uh, then see whether it works out for you. So he sent me the term sheet within the next half an hour and uh, I saw that like there was a 10 crore term sheet uh, for some 25, 26% stake. So I'm like, wow, if this guy's fool anyway, let's take his money. <laughs> so it is giving me so much. And anyway, uh, by the time uh, I had checked with uh, the industry people, and they were like, if you can get money from Sequoia, that's a great name, great thinking, uh, and you should never miss that opportunity. So, uh, so of course, by the time I got a bit of sense uh, that uh, I should somehow uh, get money from Sequoia, so uh, 
are more serious in negotiating term sheet, more serious in uh, uh, trying to get them in uh, the company uh, because they were invested in PayPal, Google, Apple, Yahoo. So any payments company throughout the world which is successful and big, uh, they had been invested. So, uh, so clearly uh, uh, it worked out uh, literally in three days time. Uh, we signed the term sheet from the first time I met them and uh, in next week we got the money in the bank. So it was relatively easier uh, experience. But I think it uh, looks easier when I'm telling the story. But uh, I asked actually Mohit, okay, why did you fund me? Okay. So, <laughs> so uh, because uh, I don't think I uh, gave you enough uh, to fund me uh, as such. And so he actually admitted that it was one of the fastest round he ever did in terms of meeting first time to money in the bank, which Sequoia actually ever did in India. So, uh, uh, so he said, uh, you know, one thing which they got really impressed with that being a non-tech guy, I could uh, had I had like at that point time five bank contracts signed. Uh, so banks, banks like ICC, HDFC, Axis, SBI, and Citibank had agreed to work with us, formally contract was signed. So we like, we have never come across a guy who without technology, without office, without employee, could convince five top banks in India to work with. And that was like, if you could do that, then with money you can do many things. So that was the thesis, uh, what he told me. That's great. What you narrated in terms of fundraising, I think that's like a dream <coughs> fundraise for yeah, any startup. <laughs> yeah, I actually admit that uh, I didn't go through uh, the hardships uh, in the first fundraise. So I actually heard a very similar story of uh, one of the other founders with, uh, who we had on Startup Mind. Uh, 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 he runs this uh, startup called My Dentist, okay. uh, Vikram Ula. So he had a very similar story. He was running business. He just is one of his ex colleagues, uh, you know. Uh, and, you know. So he uh, was part of uh, seed fund at, at one point of time. So it just happened, and they had this conversation, and he had with me, "Mujhe to ke baad three crore ka chahiye," and then they sent him a term sheet which said eight crores. Right. It was like, "Boss, okay, there are two lakh log." And one of the thing which uh, I learned over years is uh, to these guys. What matters uh, at that stage is not the money they are giving. What matters is uh, the stake which they are getting. Because think from these guys' perspective, that if they get like 30% stake and the company becomes successful, and even they don't want to prorate or participate, <coughs> in a successful company they will still end up having 15, 16, 17%, which they must have got for $2 million, $3 million. So that's the thinking uh, which goes behind uh, giving you extra, but giving you the greed of getting more stake. So uh, after that first round, uh, how many rounds done further? So we done two more rounds after that. So uh, so I think after the first round, uh, we ran the business for uh, one and a half years. Mm -hmm. And uh, actually most of the VCs uh, till date in India tell me that uh, that you don't believe uh, the business which we made. So, so far we spent uh, just 10 or 11 million dollars in the last four and a half years. And the scale and the team and the kind of revenues which we have got, people still, the VC industry still doesn't believe that uh, we have built the business in such a uh, low amount of capital uh, as such. So, we are very, very capital efficient uh, as such because uh, I'm a Marwari by genes. So, <laughs> somehow uh, I don't spend money till that time I see the return. Uh, but yeah, that has worked positive and negative both ways in the startup. Uh, but the second round, uh, we raised after one and two years, I guess, uh, one and a half or two years. And uh, we raised from uh, Japanese guys, so they had called us, uh, uh, but they had seen citrus a few locations in India when they were visiting India. And uh, again, that was a kind of a dream dating where uh, they had come first time to India, <coughs> literally still unknown company in India. Uh, they had come first time to India and they uh, happened to meet uh, us. 
because they were in the payment industry in Japan. And uh, after one and a half hour of meeting, they were like, we want to invest. I'm like, uh, I've never heard about this company. I don't know whether it's a mafia money or what. So uh, I need to understand what this company does. So, uh, so I told them, OK, yeah, let me come back to you. So in a month, I didn't respond back to them because I got busy with my usual work. Because we were not on fundraise mode at that point of time. Uh, they called back, they followed us back, saying that what happened, you were supposed to come back in two days, you haven't responded in a month. So uh, we are very, very keen to put money in. So I'm like, OK, it's getting serious discussion. So I think it's time to visit Japan. So this is how. <laughs> so I went to Tokyo first time, and uh, interesting uh, uh, visit there. So they did everything uh, what they should have done to please us so that we take uh, uh, their money. So the total fineness of the restaurants, fineness of the bars, and uh, made us meet uh, all the employees and clients of theirs just to show that uh, how big they were. In fact, they are Japan's largest payments company. So, uh, but it's just that Japan is a close economy. You don't know much what's happening there. So, uh, so yeah, we were very impressed, we came very impressed and uh, another reason to consider them is uh, I think till 2013, the scale in the industry was still not coming up. So uh, the digital population was still not that high where I mean, we started doubting on our belief that uh, whether India as a market will ever grow. So we thought if we take money from these Japanese guys, Probably we could enter Japan with their help, we could enter Southeast Asia with their help. So we started making all the strategies around how to go out of India. Uh, so that was the reason we considered them. By the, and they promised also in all, uh, they were like, they just want to give us money and take the stake. So they were like saying everything, yes, yes, and half of the thing, and anyway, you don't understand what they say. So, so, uh, so we were like, okay, anyway, these guys are giving us money and uh, those guys were like, these guys are taking us money and giving us stay in a market in India where they wanted entry. So both guys were happy, it was a win-win deal. Uh, deal happened, by the time, uh, and Japanese guys are very, very difficult to deal with, so they had promised that within a month we'll close the deal. The deal got closed in 10 months. So, uh, so by the time deal happened, the market in India started changing. So uh, clearly the wave, the digital wave started coming in India and we saw it coming. Uh, and we experienced it, I would say. So uh, suddenly I started seeing our business numbers started growing like 2x every month, 3x every month, 4x every month. And we were like, wow, we don't need to go outside now. This is the market uh, where we want to be in and we want to become leader. So that was the reason of taking the second round from Japanese Gate. It's the third round uh, six, seven months back, but that was more of a private equity round, so late stage round. Correct. Uh, okay, so, so what were probably, uh, so you talked about technology and how you kind of struggled and all that. Uh, what were the difficult times that you would have probably you know, seen in uh, you know, Citrus? Where you would have probably questioned yourself or you have thought ki are game kya kar raha hu and stuff like that. Or probably your friends or family would have really started asking you as to what are you doing? So were there any times or what was I the time? I think I would say the friends family fortunately were very very supportive. Uh, most of them are here uh, today. But, uh, but yeah, uh, we have uh, the difficult times as I mentioned. Uh, after doing running the business for one and a half years, we were still not able to achieve scale. And uh, so where uh, Sequoia started asking us what's happening, why are not able to scale, is there an issue where we can help, and you know the usual uh, boardroom meeting pressures started coming in. Uh, I would say the honeymoon period got over uh, within a year, so after a year, uh, we started seeing pressures. The revenues are not growing, it's stagnant, or it's growing like 2 3 percent a month, so which is not good enough at such a low scale. So, uh, so we also started doubting what's happening. I mean, uh, is it that uh, 
our thesis is not proving out? Is it that uh, the market is not ripe enough to do payment business in India? And uh, frankly, we are not able to crack any of the middle desk accounts because they are like 15, 16 year old player and uh, very well entrenched uh, into the payment system uh, since 15 years. Uh, so none of our thesis played out. So we launched uh, products uh, facing merchants. So we were facing a lot of pushback from the merchants. So in India, any product value proposition you give to merchants, they started negotiating on price, which was a loss making deal. So sort of didn't work out. We started uh, launching the consumer facing product, which didn't work out. So merchants were not giving us access to consumers. We did not have that many marketing dollars to spend. So we actually started questioning ourselves what next and uh, I would say the, the patience uh, to hold on for that 6 to 8 months time frame uh, really played out well. If we had broken down in that 6 to 8 months time frame where we were questioning ourselves, we did some amount of optimization on the, on the team side with all the high cost resources we started seeing what's the best way not to hire new, what's the best way to manage within the higher resources. We started doing all of those things. Uh, but uh, the ability to hold back in those six to eight months really played out well. And uh, we could survive the, uh, the whole uh, brainwave, I would say, which we had negative. So this was around which time? 2000? This was 2013. 2013. Uh, so early 2013 till uh, July 2013. So, uh, so, last question from, or last two questions from my side before we open uh, people to ask questions. So, uh, as a founder, what do you think is the role of a founder? What do you think is the most difficult for you to kind of do that? And uh, second part, in terms of what are the, what is your experience, or what's what's really important for a founder as a you know quality, or what is something that you should always you know. Uh, Watch for that. Okay, if I don't give up. Or what What is the qualities in the founder that you think? I think when you start as a founder, uh, you are typically doing every role, right? From uh, office boy to sales guy to product manager to pseudo tech guy to uh, to an ops role to basically you should be prepared for doing everything and anything under the sun. You should leave behind your baggage what you were in your past and what you were. So I remember my first office, uh, which we took, was the second basement of a building where there was no washroom. So uh, so literally I had to, uh, so and I was in ICC DKC office. If anybody, any of you have gone into that office, it's like a swanky office. Uh, you get seven course meals every day. Uh, so I was used to that and then moved into an office which is like, no washroom, the room was like my, it was like only three desks could fit in, three chairs could fit in, it was like that much size room. So, uh, so you should be prepared for uh, everything and anything. So that, uh, but at the same time, uh, yeah, the roles varies. Uh, the roles evolve because as you start building teams, uh, I think the role more and more evolved around, you become more of a HR manager where you have, uh, you focus more on hiring right people because uh, if you don't hire right people, you can never scale up. So uh, this is where uh, you should be very, very uh, picky and finicky about which kind of people you are bringing in the team because uh, it's better to delay some time hiring rather than picking lot wrong people because the wrong people taking him out of the system is a lot of pain uh, rather than the pain which you are going through delaying time period. So that's uh, so the HR manager role is the most most crucial role you to play. Uh, developing culture in the company where uh, people see you more as a friend, people see you more as uh, your colleague rather than as a boss. Because then, uh, if they don't trust you or in your ability, if they don't trust or have confidence in you that you will be able to save the ship or you will be able to captain the ship, it's sort of a very difficult to take them along uh, in your journey. So, uh, so, so that's uh, second and the third is uh, I think the investor management. So 
is uh, is, is so most uh, your 20 30 percent of the time uh, you have to manage your investors well so that you can run your business smoothly. Uh, otherwise, uh, so it's like you have to strike a right balance. If you allow to, if you allow them too much into the business, it's sort of a huge pain. At the same time, if you don't update them, what's going on? If you don't update them, what's your thinking behind what you're doing? Then also it's a huge pain because then they are in dark and then they start firing all the questions which you will be like frustrated. So you have to strike a right balance between uh, your day to day job, investor management, hiring right people, delegating them. Because also when you hire people, especially senior people, I mean generally people like us have a habit uh, uh, that okay I am smarter than that guy, I can do this better, let me get into solving the problem. I think that's the worst thing which you can do to them who you have hired and to yourself. Because then neither you are freeing up your time so that others can do their job, nor the other guy will be happy because he is not getting uh, responsibility and authority to do the job. So that's one of the very, very critical aspects. Uh, what is your second question? I'm sorry. No, so what are the qualities in the founder? I think I kind of addressed it. The, the key quality is uh, absolutely the ability to hire the uh, right guys. Uh, this is one of the super critical quality. Your one downs, uh, uh, which you, if you can hire right one downs, I would say your 90% of the job is done. So that's a very, very critical. Uh, I'm talking about the limited <coughs> startup. Uh, not talk so uh, otherwise in an unfunded startup of course uh, you need to manage your wife well uh, so that so that she doesn't trouble you when you are in office for 18 hours or 16 hours so that's the most toughest uh, part because uh, you are out on dinner and then you are checking your email you are checking your phone and then she walks away from dinner and then you don't realize so it has happened with me whether a couple of times <laughs> so uh, those who don't know, I mean, uh, Jitin's wife, uh, she's here, and uh, it's good that she's here because uh, you know, the only other actor also. It's all true, but you know, uh, it, it, uh, I think uh, you just somehow uh, learn to strike a balance uh, between your professional life because it's like your kid, which you are uh, growing up with. A startup is like your kid, so. Uh, you tend to get so involved, so involved that you forget every other thing if you are passionate enough. If you are doing it just for hobby or fun, then this is a different thing. But if you really want to make it work, you have to be super passionate. That doesn't matter what the world says, doesn't matter. Uh, uh, of course, you have to listen to everyone, but at the same time, uh, uh, remain engaged and passionate about your startup. That can uh, make you save through tough times. Good. Cool. So now uh, we open for questions. Uh, I can just have a quick uh, of hands and I can kind of go around and start from the. Uh, Hi, Jitendra. Hi. Two questions. One is you are one tech. But did you implement the security in your system so to avoid the fraud in the transaction? And second thing, what I gather, there are two types of this inbound transaction and outbound transaction. There are two types of things which happen on online payment. So on that, could you throw more light? Like? So I'll address first, first of all, so uh, I think at any point of time uh, in our company, there are at least uh, 15 to 20 people uh, who are working only on ensuring the security and the uh, safety of the system. And uh, how to protect consumers' money because, uh, as I said, we run it's a kind of infrastructure play. If the infrastructure uh, has some issue, that means millions of consumers are impacted, and uh, we can't afford to have that situation. We can't exist if that situation exists. Uh, when it's a second uh, question, the inbound and outbound transaction, I didn't get in what respect. Well, what I gather is. Suppose I went into shopper shop, right, and they have some system where you can have a transaction of their own. It doesn't go out. 
that is called inbound. <coughs> Though it is online, like, sort of. Well, the outbound is you, you can have the open like that is what I can have. So I am still not getting your question, but uh, I think if you are saying that uh, uh, when the transaction gets originated from the merchant location, uh, that's the only transaction can because we have our APIs uh, which are published on the web. Merchants can consume those APIs to uh, to initiate the transaction, and this is how the flow of the transaction works. So uh, the outbound consuming is a response to the transaction. So of course, uh, those APIs itself are sufficient enough to give response back. I'm not sure whether I got your question right. Yeah. Um, so Hi, my name is Mansi, and uh, I'm, I'm hoping that you're feeling a lot better now that one hour is done. You're feeling a little less nervous. Uh, the session so far has been fantastic. So the, one of the biggest reasons I came for your talk was because I'm a non-tech person and a founder. So uh, was there, you know, I mean, now that you have like such an elaborate team of so many tech people, um, and just when you were starting out, was there ever a moment um, when people said that maybe you should have a co-founder who's a C, you know, who's a tech person, and you were tempted, um, you know, and would, did you ever think that you know the two years that you were outsourcing and that you should probably take it in-house? Do you think outsourcing or having it in-house was like so, and and sorry, the last yeah, bit so. you just said that you got a co-founder in the last one and a half years when you actually started in 2011. So what took you so long to get? No, so by the way, I didn't say that I got a co-founder in the last one and a half years. Uh, I just mentioned uh, one of the guys' name who now happened to be my business yeah. partner. Uh, but yeah, we had uh, I had co-founder uh, uh, when I started. Uh, it's unfortunate that he's no more with the company, but uh, he was more responsible on the product side. But uh, at the same time, uh, uh, your first question was, I think, uh, how to manage the tech side of the thing, yeah. whether I should have in hindsight, whether I feel I should get, I got tech <coughs> co-founder. I think uh, where Citrus is today, I think we would have been way, way ahead if I had tech co-founder. So uh, personally, I feel that uh, we made many compromises uh, just because I did not have tech co-founder. So uh, our speed was significantly impacted. And, the, and this, of course, the various reasons where uh, I had to fire my two CTOs because they were not matching up to the speed. And when the tech co-founder, you never worry about whether he will match up your speed or not, but he is equally passionate uh, towards the journey. Yeah, I'm Ben from Pigmata. Uh, basically, one question you answered right now. Uh, why did the co-founder left? So uh, I think the visions uh, going forward, uh, going forward was not aligned in terms of. Uh, so it, my other co-founder Satin, uh, he is very very passionate about uh, the banking uh, system, how the banking system works, and how we can drive the saving habits in consumers. And uh, while Citrus vision is simplify payments, so clearly. Uh, as a board in Citrus, we are very, very uh, sure where we want Citrus to head to. So our goal is wherever the payments is a problem, we want to simplify the experience. So that's the clear vision. And this is where we'll keep investing money and resources. While his vision was getting uh, disaligned from company's vision where he was, uh, and, and to some extent, uh, I also believe in his vision, but uh, where to prioritize your resources sort of becomes uh, a question mark. So his vision was more aligned towards how to drive saving habits through an app, uh, how to drive insurance selling through an app, where there is one financial hub which could uh, own the consumer financial needs. So that was the, that's the vision in fact he's trying to drive. So does he regrets now? I don't think so because he is very very passionate about that. So he actually has uh, started a company in that respect, and uh, uh, he just set up that company like two months back. So uh, of course, uh, it's a long journey which he has to go through. Yeah, one more question: uh, How many times did you think of quitting? Yeah. Oh, many times. 
So, <laughs> yeah, so I think uh, especially uh, not now, of course, but uh, in the first uh, in the first one and a half years, uh, yeah, many times when, uh, when you don't win the deals, when you don't win the customer, when your system goes down, when you you're one of key employees, leave, when uh, so there are many events where you feel like uh, quitting, but at the same time. I think uh, personally, I would say I'm more uh, tolerant and patient enough where uh, I'm actually least impact. I'm very, I would say, unemotional towards things. So, uh, so where I, I'm able to absorb shocks uh, much easily as compared to many others. That's what my wife's feedback is to me. <laughs> so, uh, so I'm believing that feedback. But uh, yeah, it has happened many times where we have gone through difficult situations and uh, uh, I'm like, doesn't matter, let's just not get distracted by what has happened. Because it, so my belief is, there are circumstances if you can control, then you worry about controlling the circumstances. But the circumstances which you cannot control, why worry about or take the and necessary? Because then, anyway, those are beyond your control. It's the external factors which are giving you all those uh, jitters. Can I have a word with you after this event? <laughs> yes, <sure. laughs> yeah, yeah. So, are you probably trying to go this way? Okay, bye. Hi. Hi. Well, first I wanted to say thank you so much for sharing your incredible story um, with us. Um, you've delivered it with such humility, and it's, uh, it's really amazing to hear this. And um, as we discussed before, my, um, my background is in solar energy and particularly with consumer finance uh, for solar and digital payments play a big role in our business. Um, we have an office in Kenya where uh, M-Pesa is right. running wild. And um, I'm curious, um, you know, I know you talked a lot about kind of the C2B um, interface of um, mobile payments. Um, but how about um, sort of the P to P, you know, peers, just individuals sending each other money over mobile phone? Where do you see that going in India? And what's sort of held it back until now? Sure. So uh, I think we have tried uh, P to P, and uh, we're still trying. I would say. So we have tried in Feb 2014, uh, where we launched an app which was more uh, targeted towards solving the payment experience between two individuals. Uh, we failed miserably. Uh, we we ran the product for six months, and uh, we realized that the Indian consumers somehow still trusting banks more than uh, uh, non-banking company to do their payments to each other. So we could not drive that product very efficiently. Uh, we failed like miserably. Uh, but as we speak. We are actually uh, making a second attempt uh, into that segment because personally I am uh, highly convinced that doing a bank transfer between two individuals is a very, very inefficient process today. <coughs> so uh, that's one area where uh, you will see a lot of innovation uh, happening. Now, in what form factor the innovation happens, I have no visibility, no clarity. We'll try some five or six things, I want to see what sticks. At least today, I don't know what will stick. Uh, hi, this is Rahul from SaveIdeas.com. Uh, what did you ask me two questions? First, many times it happens in, like, I don't need many shadows. They are always scared that somebody will take my idea. They will steal. Right. <coughs> did you ever face that thing? First thing. And secondly, uh, there was a reason you got to uh, find it. So what's the vision because there are many mobile wallets and other things are coming up. So is Sakras going the same way kind of a mobile wallet for uh, some kind of a payment services or like what's the vision? Sure. So I think the first question is very interesting uh, because this is where even uh, I come across many people who feel uh, scared that somebody will steal their idea. My personal take on these things is uh, I think ideas are worth judge. Uh, is the execution which matters. So, uh, if you are, uh, if you have ability to, and you will see that there is like Yahoo versus Google. It's not like Mailbox was the idea which Google introduced. So, how you execute is the key uh, differentiator between one business 
or one entrepreneur versus the other entrepreneur. So, at least in my opinion, ideas are worth judge. Rather, it's good for an entrepreneur that you should discuss the ideas more and more with your family, friends, fellow entrepreneurs, because then you will get new perspectives and new insight, which you may otherwise be in your world that you are like you are super convinced because anyway you are passionate about that idea, but you may not see 360 degree view of the idea. So that's my take. Second, uh, on the mobile wallets, uh, I think uh, personally I see the value in mobile wallets in terms of uh, the arbitrage opportunity which is there, a card payment experience versus the wallet experience uh, which exists today. But uh, I don't see the reason why uh, mobile wallet should be used or I should know, I would say the PR or the, uh, the journalist have made it more uh, high for caps kind of use cases or for a small value uh, transaction. I see it is a clear differentiator and a better experience as compared to paying via card. But in payment industry, the thumb rule is very clear. If a new technology or a new experience is not simpler than paying via <coughs> card or paying via cash, it can never work in the long run. So uh, mobile wallets have a similar view. It will work for micro transactions, but for a transaction above $10 or $12, Consumers will still use their credit card, debit card, bank accounts because there is no sense in transferring money from your bank, interest earning bank account to a non interest earning, uh, non banking entity and then use that money. Uh, you are doing that today because of cashbacks and discounts, but I don't see uh, use otherwise. So, uh, so, we are, so as I said, for the micro transactions. We will, yes, push uh, wallets and all of that. But as far as our uh, core products are concerned, they will focus more and more on simplifying payment experience on mobile. And we are working with, uh, working on a couple of ideas I can share, but I don't care about ideas. <laughs> so, so one of the ideas uh, which we are introducing in March uh, sometime, and I'm sharing first time outside the company. So, uh, uh, so one of the ideas which we are working uh, or which are introducing March where, so today if you look at uh, uh, when you, every month a consumer on an average makes 5 or 6 payment transactions for sure. So either you are going for a movie, you are ordering food, you are ordering grocery, so you are doing all these transactions and the transaction value is like $3, $4, $5, $6 and every time you are going through the same payment experience where either you use wallet or you enter your card. CVV, OTP and it is like 5 steps for 5 transactions. <coughs> we are coming another product where on mobile specifically, if Citrus knows you, you actually can separate out your buying and your payment experience. So you just say buy from, buy this bottle, done. <coughs> buy PVR ticket, done. buy tiny or food, done. buy loafers, grocery, done. You don't worry about payment. Payment, we will send you a bill. You pay, pay to citrus in 14 days. So, uh, so that kind of product which you are launching it will clearly change the way payments are done on mobile. Yeah, you just spoke about cashbacks and discounts regarding the name wallets. How do these companies manage to give so much of cashbacks and uh, discounts? Uh, Chinese money. <laughs> So, I mean, uh, it's all investor money, so if, if I have to give from my pocket, I will never give. So what is the plan of action like today they can drop the invest and few days down the line, few years down the line people will stop investing and ask for returns. What will be the reaction then? So it's not few years down the line, that has started happening already uh, for the last 3-4 uh, months. Where uh, actually I would say that it's tougher now to start a business as compared to uh, uh, one year back, uh, because the one year back the funding scenario was like very very upbeat. Everybody, if you were an IITN, if you were a bets guy or an IT guy, it was very easy to get funding if you had a good idea. On an idea basis, people were raising 2 million, 3 million, 5 million. Uh, for the last 3-4 uh, months, actually the tides have turned completely, uh, where uh, investors are asking more and more questions around 
how to make money, when you will become profitable, when you will be doing break even, what's the revenue model. Earlier I remember the, when I was raising uh, Series C uh, and when I was telling investors that I, was tell, uh, I will become <coughs> break even in next three months or four months, like we don't want to discuss that. You just tell us how much, how many consumers you will bring on board. So it was more to the factor of that. But last three, four months have been a completely opposite market. So according to you, in few months down the line, probably these apps like Freecharge and Paytm and all these major business holders right now will probably go in loss. I don't have any specific view uh, to comment on, but uh, I'm assuming in that uh, their investors, if they, uh, if they have enough appetite to go through all this, they will go and I believe that uh, the investors like SoftBank or Alibaba have enough appetite. So these parties will continue for some time. But uh, otherwise, uh, the others like MobiPig and all that, uh, I'm already seeing some kind of change there. Hi. Um, okay. I just wanted to ask, are you going to venture into the brick and mortar stores like uh, POS and all this? So again my question is or my answer is same that till date uh, we haven't figured out the way or the experience which is simpler than paying via card or paying via cash. No. The day we come out with that experience we will because our company vision is very simple. Simplify payment experience, own the consumer, provide the experience which is better than what they experience today. Sorry, uh, my question was actually, are you going to start giving uh, <coughs> services to the stores? Like in our swiping or something of that type? That market is already, like every store you walk in, there are like three boxes lying there. So, uh, I think uh, fundamentally we have not been uh, in the mindset of running uh, capex heavy businesses. So, uh, I don't think so we will go down that path unless we have uh, reasonable justification that we are doing, either we are bringing some change in experience or we are introducing a product which is much, much better than today's existing product. Uh, we haven't experimented or neither we have come across uh, any such thing at least till date. So, can you come back to Yeah. Hi, uh, I'm Tara from Reply Education. 
So thank you so much. Uh, I got a lot from what you said till now. But I have two questions to ask you. So question one, I'm sure when you started up a company, you had something like a vision, right? A clear cut vision on what problem you're solving. Right. How, how much will your product deviate or at any stage, are you exactly matching your vision which you started off? So every entrepreneur over here probably has a vision which they're solving, right? But with ups and downs and people coming across, your vision changes and your product deviates, right? So what was your journey in this? And like, are you today at the same place which you wanted to solve, the same problem you're solving? Uh, question two is, you said that the main thing that a founder should be is like an HR manager, which I totally believe in. But being HR manager is more like selecting the right people, but at the same time, managing those people is a problem. So task to give, reviewing them, finding out what they're doing, and making sure that it's value for money for you as well, is something I'm facing difficulty at. So I'd like to hear your insights on that. Sure. Uh, so your first question was uh, related to the vision and the product alignment. Right. So I think uh, the vision, uh, we are still sticking to the core. So our vision was very simple that uh, simplify the payment acceptance experience and simplify the payment experience for consumer. So payment acceptance is the uh, merchant side and payment experience is the consumer side. The product has changed 360 degree or 180 degree I would say. So product has completely changed in terms of what we started with, but we have learned every month or nowadays we learn every week, every 10 days okay, whether we are thinking right, we do lot of customer validation, we do lot of uh, uh, deviation from our uh, product uh, path but uh, as far as the vision is concerned, we are still sticking uh, to the core which is uh, simplifying payments and uh, I don't think we will ever change that. Okay. The second question uh, which you asked, uh, how to uh, manage your people, I think that's the toughest of the thing and this is where, uh, I think one of the things which at least uh, worked out for me is uh, where uh, you have to lead from the front in the sense uh, it cannot be that hey I am a boss and I am leaving at 5 and do this task and then uh, work till late or 9 and then the task should be finished and I will review it when I reach home. It cannot be a situation like that. Uh, so clearly your team has to believe in you. Your team has to believe in your vision. And uh, so I'll give you one specific instance in fact, uh, which is very, very interesting. Uh, so I had hired my sales head who was still there uh, in uh, April 2012. And uh, in May 2012, I got uh, I, one of the consultants called me up and uh, he sent me, I was shocked that okay this guy joined me a month back and he is again in the market. So uh, so I actually asked him that what is, uh, are you looking for a job? He said yeah. Uh, I asked him why, you just uh, joined here like 30 days back. So uh, he said the reason, uh, because I don't believe that uh, I uh, this company can grow big. Because at that point we were processing like 5 lakh rupees worth of transaction a month. So he was like, I don't believe that uh, it can grow big because uh, to make revenues you need to process hundreds of crores uh, in a month to make significant revenues. So like from 5 lakhs to hundreds of crores, I don't know, I don't get old, I guess. So by the time uh, you reach to that stage. So I actually... Uh, uh, of course, took okay, him out for drinks and all of that. And I, I told him that you do one thing, just take on for a year, and I will deliver this for you within a year. We will reach to that stage. And till a year, don't ask me any question. Just believe in me. Uh, I think uh, till date, I make joke of that guy because he is still one of my very, very dear uh, team member. Uh, he is my still the business head uh, in the company. We process now more than uh, two and a half billion dollar worth of volume every year. But uh, he was like, you know, uh, I am. I feel so lucky that I believed in you that day uh, because otherwise I would have never seen this journey. So I think what's important is uh, you have to show your honesty. You have to share it every time with your people what you are going through, what challenges in all in all honesty and uh, why you are doing certain actions uh, in the company because if you don't share why you are doing certain things those people will be heavily disconnected <coughs> and they will never get aligned with your vision and if they are not aligned with your vision 
uh, it, the situation of reviews and doing all of that will always appear. So you have to align people with your vision. That what you're trying to build and how your actions are leading to that. They will always be aligned. Yeah, I'm Ratik Shukra. So my first question is, in the next 10 to 15 years with the entire sort of industry changing as quickly as it is, where do you see the future of the payment industry 15 or 20 years down the line? And what role do you see Citrus playing in that entire future? That's the first question. And the second question was, I remember you mentioned earlier in the talk about the number of ideas that you had. Why was it that Citrus was that one idea that you decided to go ahead with despite the technical challenges that it had vis a -vis the other ideas which were probably easier to execute? Sure. Well, I'll answer the second one for the same easier one for me. So, <laughs> so uh, uh, the reason uh, I chose payments as an industry is because uh, what I realized uh, when all of these private guys were calling me for advising them on payments, uh, investments and all of that, I'm like, when I was thinking about what idea, I'm like, wow, these guys are paying me for consulting them on the payment industry. So I'm adding value to them, that means. So that means there is some value which I have which I don't know. So rather than adding value to them, I should add value to myself. And actually that was the uh, real reason I got into payments. Because that means the external guys are saying, yeah, you know in payments something which they had value. So it was easier uh, decision to go towards payment. And of course in my ICC days, I had worked in the payment strategy. So I had a fair idea and contacts uh, in the industry. Uh, the first one, where do you see Citrus? 15 years, like too long here. I, <laughs> we plan only for one year and one and a half year. Where do you see the industry though? So the I think the industry, firstly <coughs> I feel this is the most fascinating industry and the most de-risk industry <coughs> in India today. Because uh, again, thesis is very simple. The smartphone penetration is like uh, 100 million smartphones, 110 million smartphones. Internet penetration is like 17, 18 uh, percent. The day uh, uh, with Reliant Geo 4G connectivity coming in, and with so many 4G good phones coming in, I think the, the pie is going to expand from 14 percent of population or 15 percent of population to at least 50 percent of population. That means more transaction of existing users and the increased pie. So clearly, this is an industry which will be if not a trillion dollar industry, it will be at least 500 billion dollar industry in the next 10 years. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, hi, thank you so much for sharing your experience. Uh, my name is Shrana Nadani. I wanted to know what according to you are the biggest unsolved problems in fintech or problems which have not been solved well enough? Yeah, I don't look at uh, other industry now, but uh, but yeah, in payments, uh, I clearly know what problems are, and which is why, which is what we try to solve. So clearly, one of the big uh, problem in payments today is the uh, payments on mobile phones. So what has happened is uh, when there was a desktop-based payments happening, so consumer was at ease, the connectivity was more uh, stable with the broadband connectivity. So the success rate or your attempt to success transactions were like 85-90%. But because more and more people are accessing internet first time through phone and the connectivity is uh, very shaky, so the success rate has gone down to 70%. That means every, uh, for every two good transaction, one transaction is failing. So, uh, so clearly it's a huge opportunity uh, which exists in uh, fintech space or uh, uh, which we are trying to solve. The another opportunity which exists in fintech space is uh, uh, which uh, again we are working <coughs> on uh, and I feel uh, that there are many players in that space which should exist. Uh, so all small sellers who today sell on social channels. So let's say a cupcake seller who is selling cupcakes on Facebook and uh, somehow when they have to collect payments they actually put in their account number and then they say, okay, they coordinate and then if they, let's say she has five cupcakes, a uh, household lady and the ten requests which is coming now, she will struggle which five to cater to, which five not to cater to. So the whole process of fulfillment and payment is very, very broken today. And there are million odd sellers uh, in, uh, uh, who are selling on social channels. 
and I feel that million number will go to at least 15-20 million people. So, uh, so that market will explode like anything. Hi, uh, I'm Suraj Mehta. I'm studying at the HR College. Um, so, I wanted to actually ask you. Uh, so, for example, if I have this idea or this, um, or basically this concept that I want to work towards, like you dis you discussed that you wanted to work in the whole payments industry and tap into that. So, if I had an idea or a concept that I want to tap into, um, but probably because I'm young or probably because there's not enough that I know about the whole uh, business or the startup atmosphere or entrepreneurship in general, um, like what exactly would you like have to share with me as advice on what my next step should be? Like simply based on the fact that I have a concept or an idea that I want to tap into and that's something that I've researched about or worked about. I think uh, uh, first of all being young is not a constraint because uh, I'm sure you must have heard about this guy Ritesh Agarwal who is a OEO founder. Yeah. Yeah. I think he's 21 now and he started the company at 17. So uh, I'm sure you're more than 17 now. So, uh, so that's not a, a constant factor. But at the same time, uh, I think uh, one of the things at least which I have learned, uh, because many people, uh, because I'm now slightly people uh, started approaching and all of that, and sometimes it becomes uh, a little irritating when people discuss ideas with you. Because uh, what happens is that themselves have not flushed out the idea. So I would say uh, the best thing to flush out your idea is you make slides and write your idea, your plan. Because when you write, you come up, you think at least ten things. Okay, what is the flaw in that? You don't. Uh, you address the obvious things when you're writing the idea. When you're writing, how you're going to address it? How you're going to execute it? How you're going to scale it? How you're going to take that dream to a realization because then plethora of things uh, open up which you may not have thought when the idea was just in your brain. And like, so for example, if like this planning thing that you're saying, like, I've basically like if I made like a formulated a plan and all of that, like in terms of like looking for finance or like starting operations and all of that, like how do you think the whole process should flow, like in brief, if you were to yeah, die? You're asking a <laughs> very tough question. So I would say it like this: uh, uh, you should always do the uh, MVP, the minimum viable product. Uh, forget the finances first. Uh, rather focus on uh, how can you have even a small set of ten people trying your product, what you are thinking of. Validate your idea. Take that ten people thing to hundred people. Validate your idea, and automatically. You will start seeing whether you're going down the right path, not going down the right path, and then finances and all that will either your family will help or external guy will help. If people are seeing there is a enough juice in your idea, what you are uh, doing. I can give you an input. So there's a couple of platforms like Startup Next and all, uh, so uh, or Startup Weekend. So what you do is uh, Startup Weekend gives you like two and a half day. So where your idea with the help of other people can be crushed out and created something which is more executed. So that can help you. And then you can think about from there on as to how to kind of... So you can connect with a lot of mentors there who can kind of then help you. This is Startup. Startup Next and Startup Weekend. Thank you so much. Come, you had a question? Yeah. Uh, so no, uh, guy, uh, after you have a question as well. Okay. So fine. I think that. My name is Daesh. Okay, thanks for uh, uh, giving us so uh, uh, much of knowledge so uh, of obstacles given. Things, you know, from what I understand about your business, this program, is uh, the basic uh, mode around the business is uh, customer experience, technology, and people. Right. Now, this is something, in my opinion, which can be replicated. So yeah. customer experience uh, can replicate technology. Can replicate. Five years of the line. 10 years of life, and what is it one factor which will ensure that citrus payment continues to happen? So, let's say, as the growth goes out, and you have many options. So, you can get customer experience, you can get technology. 
I mean, you know, what is it? One factor which will ensure that citrus retains market share, retains its spending power, and uh, continues to probably grow in the second. in the butane payment businesses, uh, it sort of uh, does not go down overnight. So, uh, because it's not a consumer app, which is like uh, there in consumer hand and suddenly uh, consumer gets another app and he starts using that other than this. It's an infrastructure. So, uh, the infrastructure means there are pipes laid with merchants and uh, like till date, uh, we have been in the market for four years or now in operation. We have been able to display the build desk as a player. And the reason uh, uh, they have laid pipes with few set of merchants, which are very well entrenched. Your offering to them is very well entrenched. So it's not just about the always about the experience, but it's all uh, more about as you sort of scale up the relationship with the customer. Because it's a B2B kind of an offering when it comes to the merchant acceptance. So in a B2B offering, your relationship matters a lot. Your account servicing capability matters a lot. Your ability to deliver something or other thing new to that client matters a lot. How you are uh, updated with new trends that matters a lot. Because then beyond that, the margins are very thin in this industry. The margins are like 20, 25 basis point. Now that's the margin play which somebody is playing in. Now in that, let's say somebody gives a discount of 10 basis point or 15 basis point. The client is not going to move away. It's like, for oh, what? For 15 basis point with the impact, maybe you would like to be. So I'm like, rather, I would work with a guy who's, who I know, who I better equipped with, unless I don't innovate, unless I don't catch up with the trends uh, which are there in the industry. So the reason we could enter into the market <coughs> because there was no experienced layer which anybody had built uh, before we entered the market. So in terms of how a consumer experiences a checkout with the merchant, how a merchant experiences the analytics at the back, how a merchant experiences the recon in the back, everybody was going through Excel sheets and everything. So we sort of we addressed that part and this is how we could get entry into the market. After us actually there is no other payment company which has come so far. So uh, there is one company which recently has started our razor pay or something from out of Jaipur. I think, but uh, I haven't seen so far any the product. Of course, we look at we watch our competitors very, very closely, be it the small or young or uh, big. Uh, I haven't seen any product or experience difference uh, so far in any of the new companies which have come. Okay. So, this one, another uh, question. Any plans for uh, taking now uh, you know, investments to the next stage? Uh, I think right now we are sufficiently capitalized and this IPO and going listing is like the thing where uh, you uh, have many more hassles uh, which you bring in along in terms of compliance and filing and regulations and all of that. So I think we want, we want to remain agile. Uh, so we definitely have no plans for next five years to uh, on the public side, we definitely want to grow fast, remain private and uh, grow faster and address the bigger market opportunity which is coming up in the next five years because when you are in the, uh, when you remain private, you have much more agility in moving things, changing course, changing, uh, even if your revenues are not meeting the estimates for a quarter, it doesn't matter because you can explain it to three people who are on board rather than uh, 3 lakh or uh, 3 million people who you need to explain. So those are the things uh, uh, we, I think next 5 years, <coughs> clearly will remain private and if we need capital, we will raise it because now, fortunately we have reached to the stage where uh, the capital raising, the new capital raising for us is not that difficult. I am not saying <coughs> easy, but not that difficult for, uh, because there is a base of business which is growing uh, on its own organically. So we are growing almost four to five x every year. So that's uh, taking it very well. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, only one question: uh, like How many times have your systems have been hacked or profit transactions? So our systems have never been hacked, fortunately. Uh, 
because uh, I think our uh, tech teams are very good and uh, we also use uh, cyber crime uh, hackers, uh, professional hackers, resident hackers uh, who we, uh, we give them assignments to hack our system so that we can see uh, what are the vulnerabilities and uh, in fact then if, so nobody has been able to crack our firewall so far and then we actually allow them to come inside the firewall and then we ask them to get into the card data system whether they can reach the card data ever and uh, so far so there were a few vulnerabilities which we have addressed <coughs> but uh, external threat has never happened Uh, Rajan, I have been uh, consulted to the industry on regulatory compliance issues, uh, on strategies from government relations. I like to know since this startup startups are being mushrooming all over India on this period, typically we are going through a startup age now. Now, what kind of a role that you think a government can play in your uh, industry? Or, uh, is it the, the current government policies and government system, is it a brain or a boom to the system? What are the specific policies you expect from the government? I mean, we had a in fact, I'm sure you must have read uh, there was this Startup India Summit which happened in Delhi with the, uh, with the Prime Minister. So, uh, fortunately, uh, and that was one of the most uh, encouraging things which have come across from the government side. So, uh, was part of that and we highlighted uh, things in terms of, so basically one thing which came out very clearly is the lesser the government intervenes uh, is better for the ecosystem. So, uh, so I would say we don't need help, but rather we don't need intervention. That's the best help we can get. Do you think it's really possible? <coughs> yeah, I think uh, if you look at the new uh, the, <coughs> the program agenda which they released after the summit. That is on paper. Practically, would you really feel that? Yeah, they are working on it because we have already started uh, getting uh, involved with you. The departments have written to us. RBA is meeting us very 